Good evening, everybody. At this time, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Belvoir City Council. Today is Monday, September the 28th, 2020. If I could have you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. to the flag, the flag of the United flag States of America, of America. America. And to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under, under God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. This time, Pam, could you please call the roll? Yes. Mr. Hoke. Here. Mr. Havens. Here. Dr. Van Valdhuysen. Here. Mr. Greenwood. Here. Mrs. Middlestetter. Here. And Mayor Schwaller. Here. At this time, we have a motion to excuse Nick Edwards from tonight's meeting. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Oh. Thank you. Okay, I missed who seconded that. Ernie. Ernie, thank you. A motion was made by Mrs. Middlestetter to excuse Mr. Edwards from tonight's meeting. This was seconded by Mr. Havens. Mrs. Middlestetter? Yes. Mr. Havens? Yes. Mr. Hoke? Yes. Dr. Van Valdhuysen? I think there was a yes there. You unmute. You unmute. <laughs> Mr. Greenwood? Yes. Mayor Schwaller? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. In everyone's packets, we have the meetings of our, or the minutes of our last meeting, which was September the 14th. Did anyone have any changes or correction to those minutes? None, Mayor. No. Being none, I declare the minutes approved as submitted. Next up on the agenda is mayor announcements and special guests. Before we get to our special guests, I do have one announcement relative to uh, trick or treat. As we draw closer to Halloween, the question has turned to trick or treat and what each community is planning, whether to hold it or cancel it. The governor has put the decision in local government hands. The Ohio Department of Health has also issued guidelines for safe Halloween celebrations, including trick or treat. With that being said, we do not plan to cancel trick or treat, but rather leave it up to the parents and residents to choose if they would like to participate this year. Trick or treat is not a city sanctioned event, but rather a community event. The city has always stood with the other Dayton area communities in designating October 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. as trick or treat. Participation, rain, shine, snow, or pandemic has always been and always will be up to the community members to choose whether or not to participate. We simply ask that everyone stay safe and take the proper precautions to stay safe this year in light of the pandemic. At this time, we have kind of a full agenda tonight, but if anyone in council cares to comment on my statements, I uh, please invite him to do so now. I totally agree. We've been through this so far. Parents and community members are certainly capable of deciding whether or not they want to participate. They don't want to participate, turn the porch light off. That, that's great, great. Thank you, Wayne. I, I echo the same sentiments. Uh, use the porch light. I think it's kind of known that if it's off, don't go there. If it's on, you're welcome. So that's all I have. Thanks, Forrest. Anybody else? I agree. Okay. That's our path going forward at this time. If anything changes, we'll certainly let you know. But again, we do not plan to cancel truck or treat. Next up on the agenda is the Beautification Awards for 2020 presented by Michelle and Rob Johnson. I see Rob Johnson's on. Welcome, Rob. You're on mute right now. All right, there yeah, we go. Muted. Very good. Yes. I muted my headset. I'm, uh, I'm on uh, Zoom all day long, so. Okay, good. All right. So let's, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll start the uh, presentation here. So th this is the uh, presentation for the 2020 Bellbrook Beautification Award winners. My wife, Michelle, and I uh, took this over last year. 
My wife is unable to join tonight. She's busy with the uh, Green County Board of Elections. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, the 2020 committee members, um, we had the following residents, par part of our committee this year, Becky Wick, Sophia Briley, Linda Edwards, Bonnie Howe and Betty Ogrid, and my wife and myself as co-chairs. Uh, my wife and I were members for several years before Bron Wilson retired. Well, I have this uh, slide present, actually, am I, do you see my presentation? I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, I wasn't sharing that. We're good, we see it now. All right, yeah, not the presentation. All right, so now you see it, yes. So again, here, here are the committee members. Uh, while I have this slide presented here, you can see an example of the uh, award that the recipients receive. Uh, there's two things that the recipients receive when, uh, when they win the beautification award. Uh, the, the city puts out a sign for about a month. Uh, but then the city, uh, the recipients also receive this uh, laser engraved rock that is theirs to keep forever. Um, we're fortunate that the uh, high school STEM program has a laser engraver and they perform the laser engraving of these rocks. Uh, and um, so kudos to Blake Barnes this year, uh, as much as uh, last year as well, who provided these uh, engraved rocks to us. So a couple uh, things that regarding award guidelines, the city is divided into five sections and I'll share a map of that in a moment. There's four, the uh, committee members are each assigned a section and they come back with four nominees for each section and all of those nominees are presented to all the committee members with the, the, uh, the top two vote receivers in each section uh, receiving a beautification award. We have bun, excuse me, one business winner Citizens may nominate homes as well, although this year we did not receive any uh, nominations from citizens. And as far as eligibility goes, city council members, beautification committee members, and winners within the past five years are ineligible. And uh, I'll go ahead and share the, share the map now. Are, are you able to see the map or am I not sharing that properly? Oh, I don't think I'm sharing that properly. So the city is divided into five sections. Go ahead and step through the, uh, the award winners now. So our first winner in the section A was uh, Ron and Joanne Coleman. Uh, each of these award winners, we, we were able to take photos of their houses so everyone can enjoy what we see here. Another Section A winner, Michael and Brunhilde Stetham. Section B, we have Robert and Vicki Noose. And Douglas and Donna Merrill. Moving on to Section C, we have uh, Robert Gooden and Lisa Gooden, that is a uh, father and daughter. And then we have Stan Steve and Wendy Lutz. Moving on to Section D, we have Ann Beeman on Upper Hillside. And then Richard Scott. Section E, we have Michael and Marsha Rausch. As well as Lewis and Patricia Orban. And then our business winner th this year was a collection of uh, dentists. We have uh, Will and Do William Dolan, a dentist, and Burton Hagler as the orthodontist, as well as Leanne Yelly, a photographer. So this is uh, down by Lakeman. And that's the end of the presentation there. 
Uh, normally, in years past, we would have the uh, re the uh, the award winners attend the city council meeting, and we would uh, present them their award winning rocks. But uh, given the fun with COVID this year, we, as we notified the recipients, we presented their rocks to them at that time. Any questions? Nicely done. Thank you. Rob, no, thank you and your wife for your time and effort. I know this is a big deal and it's a very simple presentation, but I know the process of choosing the winners is very involved and takes a lot of your time. So we certainly want to congratulate the winners and also thank you and your wife for devoting your time and effort to uh, head up this program. Certainly. We've uh, been in Bellbrook 20 plus years and love it. And so anything we can do to support the community. We greatly appreciate it. This is a big deal for our citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Next up on the agenda, we have a public hearing for ordinance 2020 6. Mrs. Middlestetter. Oh, yes. Elaine, you're on mute right now. I forgot I was reading. I have to pull my agenda. Just real quick, guys. Um, if this is a public hearing uh, and the public's not um, able to see this, or is it still a public hearing? They are able to join via Zoom, Ernie. So the link was published on our website and on the agenda. And so it's, it's still... It's still live on the internet. It's just not yes. coming to YouTube. And, and so, it is on cable, even though yes. YouTube isn't working. So, so participa so, participation is still possible through the Zoom link, which was in the agenda. So it, it is still possible for people to participate if they choose to. So yes, it, it's still technically a public hearing. Okay. Which Zoom is really the only platform that somebody can participate in the meeting versus YouTube, which is just a viewing capability. I thought the Zoom said only if you wanted to speak, should you join the Zoom? Well, if someone wants to speak, then we we do have attendees listening in right now. So they, they have the ability to raise their hand and be allowed to speak, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Elaine, you're on mute. Which resolution am I reading? 2020-Y? 20, no, it's ordinance 2020-6. It's page 19 in the packet. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. No problem. Uh, ordinance number 2020-6. An ordinance... Oh, jeez. Come on. An ordinance adopting the updated comprehensive plan for the city of Bellbrook. Whereas the city of Bellbrook has utilized a comprehensive plan as a tool to assist in making decisions related to the vision and planning of the community since the first iteration in 1974. And coordinating, and whereas the city entered into an agreement in 2017 with the Regional Planning and Coordinating Commission of Greene County to update the city of Bellbrook's comprehensive plan, which was completed in 2019. And whereas in 2019, both the city of Bellbrook and planning board and city council each reviewed the plan and recommended its approval. And whereas this 2019 city of Bellbrook comprehensive plan remains insubstantially 
the same form since the initial review with the exception of one revision to the pedestrian bike and multi-use path map located on page 22 and attached here too. And whereas there have been previously adopted legislation related to the adoption and revision of the comprehensive plan, and whereas the current version of the comprehensive plan for the city of Bellbrook on file with the clerk of council shall take control over any previously adopted comprehensive plans where inconsistencies may exist. And whereas city council hereby desires to adopt the 2019 comprehensive plan for the city of Bellbrook as the official document to assist in the decision-making process for planning, visioning, and other legislative matters related to the city of Bellbrook. Now, therefore, the city of Bellbrook hereby ordains section one, that the 2019 comprehensive plan for the city of Bellbrook on file with the city clerk of council is hereby adopted. Section two, city council further finds and orders that this comprehensive plan shall supersede and take precedence over and control any future developments. Section three, it is hereby found and determined that all formal actions of this council concerning and relating to the adoption of this ordinance were adopted in an open meeting of this council and that any and all deliberations of this council that resulted in such formal action were in meetings open to the public in compliance with all legal requirements, including but not limited to section 121.22 of the Ohio Revised Code. Section four, this ordinance shall take effect and be in force from and after the earliest period provided by law. All, all yours, Lisa, or <laughs> Melissa. Okay, so as referenced in the ordinance, the comprehensive plan is being adopted via ordinance it was originally adopted by resolution and i know that this might seem a little bit confusing but over the years the comprehensive plan um, since its inception uh, or the first iteration in 1974 has been adopted and modified by both ordinance and resolution so um, the last time that it was changed it was changed by resolution so when it was adopted in 2019 it was adopted by resolution so what we're doing is we're solving two problems with this ordinance and the first uh, problem that we're solving is that we are formalizing the comprehensive plan by ordinance and we are specifically and intentionally making this an ordinance and um, any change to the comprehensive plan moving forward will also be via ordinance so um, we are, we are adopting the ordinance tonight, and then we are also changing one thing, which was a map on page 22. And when the public, or I'm sorry, when the introduction of the ordinance occurred, there was just the uh, one page map, which was in the packet. And then um, we were kind of flipping back and forth during the introduction of the ordinance to try to compare. And uh, so there is a side by side in tonight's packet, which shows the old map and the new map. So there was a change to one line, which shows that um, in the first iteration, there was a proposed multi use path that extended from dots um, up to uh, Terrace Creek, I believe, um, all along Sugar Maple Place. So that is actually an existing sidewalk and was never meant to be a proposed multi-use path. Um, so the majority of that is an existing sidewalk. And then there will be a connection, which will be a uh, walking path, but it will not be either a sidewalk or a multi-use path, which is categorized in this pedestrian bike and multi-use path map. So. There was that uh, that correction, which removes that purple line and then uh, just shows the existing sidewalk, which is actually in place up in that neighborhood. And then um, that's it. So that's the only change. So we are 
We are making the comprehensive plan formalized by ordinance, and then we are correcting the one map. So that is the uh, that is that is what we are doing with this ordinance tonight. So I will take any questions related to that. Any questions of council? No questions from me. Anyone else? So I'm assuming then from what I'm looking at on that map that the walking path down the hill up by dots is no longer on the map. It's not going to be there, that walking path. So this map, uh, Elaine, is just showing multi-use paths and sidewalks and so that is going to be a walking path which is neither categorized as a sidewalk or a multi-use path so that's just going to be a walking path so it's based on the categories in this map it doesn't really fall into either of those but it is a part of the record plan so it will be installed but it's not categorized as a multi-use path or a sidewalk so it's it's kind of a an anomaly in terms of its construction. Okay, so the, that it's still going to go in, but not as part of the comprehensive plan. Correct, because it's not categorized as a sidewalk and it's not categorized as a multi-use path. So it, okay. it is part of the record plan, which was adopted by ordinance. So it's it, it will still go in, but it's not categorized in a way that this map would recognize. Okay. I think I got that. Anyone else? That being the case, given this is a public hearing, does anyone from the viewing audience have anything to present? Pam, is anyone raising their hands or? I am looking just to make sure, give everyone half a second to do that. And I have not, no one has asked to speak, so. Given that's the case, I now declare this uh, public hearing to be closed. And at this time, I'd like a motion regarding ordinance 2020-6. Okay. I move that we adopt motion um, ordinance 2020-6. Thank you, Elaine. Can I have a second, please? I'll say that. Thank you, Forrest. A motion was made by Mrs. Middlestetter to adopt Ordinance 2020-6, an ordinance adopting the updated comprehensive plan for the city of Bellbrook. And this was seconded by Mr. Greenwood. Mrs. Middlestetter? Yes. Mr. Greenwood? Yes. Mr. Hoke? Yes. Mr. Havens? Yes. Dr. Van Veldhuizen? Yes. And Mayor Schweller. Yes. Thank you, Pam. Mm -hmm. We have no introductions of ordinances tonight, but we do have two resolutions. At this time, is Rick Clemens uh, signed on or in the waiting room? I know he wanted to be part of this. We also have Jessica Hansen, Planning and Zoning Assistant as well, so she will be added in as a panelist as well. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, this is John Welcome, Jessica. We're waiting for Rick. Pam, could you maybe mute 
everybody and then maybe let people come back in. Maybe that might fix the feedback issue or the audio issue. I'm sharing two Rick Clemens boxes too. That might be a problem. I believe that his engineer um, typically uses one that's labeled as him as well. So it's it's probably uh, Mr. Clemens and then his engineer. That's the way it was in the planning board meeting at least. So I'm making an assumption here though. Right. There's Rick. Rick, was John trying to get in just a little bit ago? I, I saw him for a minute and then he disappeared. <laughs> In the distorted audio, I heard it's him say this is um, John Brumball, I think. So maybe he's trying to log back in. We could probably go ahead, Mayor, with uh, at least getting the resolution read in, especially since we have Je Jessica and Rick both here, and then we can go from there. Okay, welcome, Rick, and welcome, Jessica. Resolution 2020-X, Councilman Havens. Thank you, Mayor. Resolution number 2020-X, a resolution approving the replat of lots 27A and 26B of the Highview Terrace subdivision, section four. Whereas the Ohio Revised Code sets forth the City of Belbrook Planning Board as the designated municipal platting authority. And whereas the requested plat meets the requirements of the City of Belbrook Zoning Code and subdivision regulations and Whereas the Belbrook Planning Board has recommended approval of the replat of lots 27A and 26B of the Highview Terrace subdivision, section four. And whereas the city of Belbrook subdivision regulations stipulate that the changes to a recorded plat shall be approved by action of the city, Belbrook City Council. Now, therefore, the city of Belbrook hereby resolves section one that the replat of lots 27A and 26B of the Highview Terrace subdivision section four is hereby approved for recording purposes. Section two, that the mayor and clerk of council are authorized to affix their signatures to the revised record plan. Section three, that this resolution shall take effect and be in force forthwith. Uh, so that's actually the uh, Haley Dusa group free plat 26A and not specifically for the Clemens development. So Jessica is the resolution referencing the wrong lot number. There should be there should be two different uh, replats. So there should be a replat for lot 27a and lot 26b and there should be a replat for lots 40 4e 4f and 4g yes jessica the one that was just read in is for 27a and 26b okay so there's a separate resolution for the um the number of other lots that you yeah so that's it's that's specifically not that's specifically not the clemens development one that's uh haley dusa group do we have them here, Pam, by any chance? Okay. Well, the first uh, resolution is Clemens, correct? No, that, the, the one he just read was um, Haley Dusa. Okay, got it. Okay. 
but uh, planning board see no issues see no issues with this it's uh, basically just to um, in the staff report you'll see uh, there's an existing drive that crosses in the other lot it's just to replat around that drive um, to ensure that you know whoever buys that lot doesn't have a, a driveway that shouldn't belong there so my only concern here is why wasn't this done before the driveway was put in that's a good question um we really don't have in our uh, planning any sort of like permit for a driveway the only thing we really regulate is a curb cut onto the drive um and that specifically we have ryan go out and you know make sure that they're doing it to specification but uh, they do own both lots so um, it is within their privy if they wanted to to you know make it cross the boundary line there so I believe they might want to sell the lot so if so that that would they would mean they would have to of course replant So they, we don't know whether it was intentional or not. It may have just been an oops to put the driveway across the lot like lot line like that. Um, it could have been, but it looks it looks intentional. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty far over the lot line, to be honest. So, but the fact they own the other lot, I guess, makes it a little bit yeah easier to understand. So you're saying that they are planning to now sell that lot. Uh, I don't know that for sure. That's my assumption. That would be my assumption. The reason why they want to replat it would be for the for resale. That way they have their driveway secured. They don't have to have an easement for access of the driveway. Because if they did sell it, that's the only way they could have access to the driveway would be to have some sort of easement agreement with the current the new owner. And planning board was okay with it. Yes. The and, replant. And just for the record, just because it wasn't referenced in the resolution, do we have the date just so it can be recorded in the minutes as to when planning board approved this? I know that they did both of these resolution replats um, at their right. last meeting. Yeah, give me just a second. Sorry. Yeah, it was on September the 17th. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was in the official record. Okay. Any other questions on council with regards to resolution 2020-X? So uh, exa exactly how far over is the new line for the replat? Um, I, I don't, let me look at it here. Um, it looks like the previous map had 115 feet originally on the curb it looks like it's about uh 20 or 30 feet i can't honestly uh discern <clears throat> but they still have enough um frontage on the, the right of way and everything so it's not oh okay i see the new line okay i'm sorry yeah. looks like it goes now down to 88.44 feet Will that cause any issues for that new lot? Any restrictions? Uh, it, should, it shouldn't. Um, there are other lots that have similar frontage in Highview Terrace with the same, that same frontage. So, okay. Uh, Jessica, doesn't the uh, police chief have some involvement on a curb cut? Um, perhaps to make sure that uh, with a curb cut to make sure that it is. Um, site distances are insured but first we actually changed that oversight to the service director just because he had a little bit more insight in terms of uh, roadway infrastructure and things like that so um, it used to just solely be approved by the police chief and um, with some conversation we decided that uh, we were going to put that approval in the hands of the service director so it it did switch so it did used to be the uh police chief but i mean of course they work together but 
it just made a little bit more sense for the curb cuts to go to the service director versus the police chief. Okay. As long as it's covered. So did they get that approval before they put the driveway in? Uh, I, I can't remember. I'm not sure when the driveway is installed, to be honest. So, so the separate curb cuts, Ernie, would come if somebody wanted to add a driveway to their lot or like this is part of a plan development. So since it's part of a plan development, they don't need separate approval for a curb cut. Okay. Any more questions of council? Harry Nank, we have a motion regarding resolution 2020-X. So moved. Thank you. Can we have a second? A second. Thank you. All right, a motion was made by Mr. Havens to adopt resolution 2020-X, a resolution approving the replat of lots 27A and 26B of the Highview, sub, Highview Terrace subdivision section four. This was seconded by Dr. Van Veldhuizen. Mr. Havens. Yes. Dr. Van Veldhuizen. Yes. Mr. Hoke. Yes. Mr. Greenwood. Yes. Mrs. Middlestetter. Yes. Mayor Schwaller. Yes. Thank you, Pam. Next up is resolution 2020-Y. Dr. Van Bildhuizen, please. All righty, Mayor. Thank you. Resolution number 2020-Y, a resolution approving the replat of lots 1E, 3D, 4B, and unplatted lands into lots 1F, 4D, 4E, 4F, and 4G of Highview Terrace subdivision Sorry, we had a pop up covering the next word, sections one and two. Whereas the Ohio Revised Code sets forth the City of Bellbrook Planning Board as the designated municipal planning authority, and whereas the requested plat meets the requirements of the City of Bellbrook Zoning Code and Subdivision Regulations, and whereas the City of Bellbrook Planning Board has approved the replat of lots 1E, 3D, 4B, and unplatted lands into lots 1F, 4D, 4E, 4F, and 4G of the uh, subdivision sections one and two. I apologize, Mayor. It's um, just one of those nights um, with the uh, computer wanting to just fight away. Uh, let me You're go back to the sentence um, into lots 1F, 4D, 4E, 4F, and 4G of the Highview Terrace subdivision sections one and two, and whereas the City of Bellbrook subdivision regulations stipulate the changes to a recorded plat shall be approved by action of the Bellbrook City Council. Now, therefore, the City of Bellbrook hereby resolves section one, that the replat of lots 1E, 3D, 4B, and unplatted lands into lots 1F, 4D, 4E, 4F, and 4G of the Highview Terrace subdivision, section one and two, is hereby approved for recording purposes. Section two, that the mayor and clerk of council are authorized to affix their signatures to the revised record plan. And section three, that this resolution shall take effect and be enforced forthwith. That's it, sir. Thank you, Dave. I know tonight we do have the developer here and also the engineer and if one of them would like to speak now be a good time otherwise we'll just go to questions yeah i mean obviously this brick climb is obviously the purpose of this replant is to clean all that up at the entrance of the development originally there is what well, i should say currently there's a stub street that goes into that property that we were we were going to tie that into the property next to it for development, which we are not going to develop now. So that's the main reason for this replat. There'll be a little ball that's put in down there at the bottom uh, where the stub street is now, which cleans up the, uh, which cleans up the streets. Okay. Rick, am I looking at it correctly? Does it look like a couple of lots are gonna be landlocked totally or? 
No, the, those those lots are to be annexed. Those two are, are going to become one. And that back piece will have to be annexed because the back piece is currently in Sugar Creek Township. Okay. So okay. in talking to Barry Tiffany, are you there? Yeah. So in talking with Barry Tiffany, he agreed that the process, because I'm not sure the exact process for the annexation of those pieces, he made it sound like it was more of a administrative because both both uh, jurisdictions were in a, approving it so that we could go ahead and record this and then come back in with all the paperwork that has to go back and forth between the city and the Bellbrook, or uh, between the Bellbrook and Township to, uh, to, to get it all in one piece of land. There, there's a lot right next to, and I don't know what lot number it is, but the, the, the wedge, the wedge shaped lot, there's a lot next to it. I think might be 2B, I'm not for sure, where there's a house built on it and the house is in Bellbrook, but then the, the piece of land behind it is in Sugar Creek Township. And Sugar Creek said, you know, we don't, we want to clean all this up. So and I think Bellbrook's all along been saying, yeah, we, we, we want to make that into Bellbrook. And, but Barry Tiffany, because the answer to time said, let's go ahead and, and record it and then we'll come back in and annex it. Okay, thank you, Rick. Does so, anyone on council have questions? Melissa, do you have something? I'm sorry. I can give an update on that. I did speak with Barry Tiffany and um, that annexation process should be taken care of in the next 90 days. So that is in the works. And so um, just like Mr. Clemens said, that'll all be uh, coming before council. And then this is just something that happened first and then the annexation process it's a little more time consuming and uh, we're all in agreement with it and it'll be coming to council hopefully by the first of the year. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Jessica, any comments from the standpoint of staff on this? Uh, no, uh, so there is a uh, comment on the plat uh, that stipulates that if he had, if, even if it didn't, if we didn't annex, there is a stipulation on the plat that those lots have to go together. Um, regional planning approved it, and Sugar Creek Township, uh, Sugar Creek Township approved it. So um, I have no issue with the replat, um, especially now that Melissa has verification from Barry. So. Okay. Thank you. So who's gonna maintain this property over time? Well, the the the, the lot that's the wedge shaped lot. My niece is actually going to take that lot and build a house on it. Okay. She actually works for the building company, so she's gonna she's gonna build a house on that, and then and then the lot to the right of that. I don't know what the lot number is. I don't have any anything in front of me. Three um, G, three E. Excuse me. I think it's three E. Okay, that lot is being purchased by the person on lot thirty seven who we built a house for. So it's under contract that they're going to buy that lot, and then they're going to maintain that lot okay so um it, was there anything that, that kind of led to this change from the original plan of putting a house there that well you yeah you're, you're six, yeah you're 60 feet above the street so it's it, if you've been up in high view terrace you see how how that that slope is i mean this whole development's been this way on one side you got the creek the slopes down to the creek on the other side you got the hillside so you know what we did on the lot 37 is we put a switchback driveway and that and that driveway goes up like 24 feet from the curb to the top of the driveway this lot would probably be 30 feet from the street up to where you get to it so it's, it's almost it's almost an unbuildable lot i mean you could build on it but it'd be very very expensive to build on it initially my son came in um, and was going to do something on a lot. And then we kind of switched gears. And then the, the people that were building the house were said they would buy a lot. So we said, fine, that, that, that's probably a better fit because you build a house there, that's fine, but you may never be able to sell it down the road. So, and she's going to, she's going to, uh, she wants to put wildflowers up through on that whole hillside is what she told us she needed to do. So I'm sure they'll, uh, dress it up pretty nice. Good. 
Good, thank you. Any other questions on council? Uh, this is just kind of clerical, but um, one, I assume there's no grade issues with these lots being merged together. And then two, uh, it looks like the, the city of Bellbrook and Sugar Creek Township line goes through, is it lot 1D and lot 4C? It's 4D, it 4G and 4F, I believe. So our lots are, um, let's see. We have one F and three E are located in the city of Bellbrook. So that's the smaller lots. So one F is a smaller lot that's um, located at what, at what would be at the end of the partial yeah. cul-de-sac and then the larger lot and then the lots behind it those are the lots that are in sugar creek township that would be annexed and that are currently what are considered landlocked and then those yeah. would be combined with the other parcels to clean up that whole whole area there so my question though the section of land that's labeled lot 4c is that going to remain sugar creek township I'm on page 33 of the pa of tonight's packet. I see 4G, but I don't see 4C. 4C is behind um, 1D, it looks like. Yeah. Jessica on Tears Creek. Right before that stub. I think that that's what TJ is talking about. Correct. Is that going to remain Sugar Creek Township? Oh, oh um, yeah, I would assume that that will, but I am not 100%. Okay. I'm not 100% on that. So that that would probably be part of the talk. So um, I, I'm not back when Kara brought this up originally. I can't remember if she talked about that parcel as well. Um, so it's possible that that could go too, but I'm not I'm not 100% certain. We, so we that's something any, we can bring up. We don't have any control over that lot. Okay. So that lot's owned by the owner of that house that owns that lot. Okay. So, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the resolution says uh, includes us making decisions on lots that are not in the city. Well, you're not necessarily making decisions on lots that aren't in the city. So you, you are approving the replat, and by approving the replat, you are in effect, you are in effect allowing it to go further but um you're really only approving the two lots that are in the city that's only the thing that's the only authority really belper has at the moment okay. right so i think we should strike all the other stuff and only uh, approve what we have authority to approve right or am i missing something um correct well, but if the replat as a whole is going back to the county and the township and the county uh, Green County Regional Planning have all approved the replat, I mean, we're all we're all approving our own sections of the replat as a whole, though. Yeah. So I guess Correct. if you're if we're saying we're all in agreement with how it stands, I don't see a problem with that. So, OK. Yeah, um, can you guys hear me? This is John Brimball. Yes. We can hear you, John. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I worked with uh, Peggy Middleton over at Tax Maps and and Regional Planning, and this is how they instructed uh, us to prepare this replot. And uh, we, you know, we we worked with them to prepare prepare the replot this way. Um, so I mean, that that's kind of the why it's the way it is and this was their um direction that they gave us so i just wanted to share that you know that that's why it's the way it is with the with the lot the partial lot, you know the lot in bellbrook and the lot behind it in sugar creek township so that's how we dealt with this situation thank you john yep Any other questions of council?
Seeing none, we have a motion regarding resolution 2020 Y. I'll make a motion to have it approved, Mayor. Thank you. Can I have a second, please? A second. Thank you. A motion was made by Dr. Van Beldhuizen to adopt resolution 2020-Y, a resolution approving the replat of lots 1E, 3D, 4B, and unplatted lands into lots 1F, 4D, 4E, 4F, and 4G of Highview Terrace subdivision sections 1 and 2. This was seconded by Mr. Hoke. Dr. Van Beldhuizen. Yes. Mr. Hoke? Yes. Mr. Havens? Yes. Mr. Greenwood? Yes. Mrs. Middlestetter? Yes. Mayor Schwaller? Yes. Just I'd like to thank uh, Rick and John and Jessica for being here this evening to help present it and you know, walk through these questions. It was very beneficial. Thank you. Thanks thank for your you. input. Thanks. This time we'll move Thanks. on. Pardon me? This time we'll move on to the city manager report. Okay, so we are going to have an old business item uh, that's coming that's included in my report. So Kelsey Hurlbert, uh, executive director of the Family Resource Center is gonna be joining us shortly. Uh, we, we will also have a new business item that's gonna go over personal policy manual updates. Um, so in terms of my updates, uh, I've got some some uh, crosswalks downtown that we're looking at. So in preparing for the 2021 budget, we're trying to look at uh, some capital projects and kind of looking at the comprehensive plan and figuring out what we can identify as projects in the comprehensive plan to fold into the budget. And one of that is crosswalks. And uh, Ryan uh, Paisley, service director, and I have been working on that. And it's been very interesting. Um, I don't know if council might realize this, but on Franklin Street, we have uh, four, no, not just Franklin Street. Franklin Street in Maine, the main crossroads, cross uh, roads of downtown, we have four crosswalks, the entire community, four, it's wild. So um, we are identifying uh, additional crosswalks. We have none on Main Street, which to me is really surprising. So uh, we're identifying some uh, crosswalks to be able to install some facilities, which would include uh, some sidewalk continuation, some ramps, some um, curbing, some things like that, because uh, like up on, uh, I believe it's Ridgeway, we have a sidewalk that just kind of dumps off into grass and then there's a gap in between the street. So we wanna try to fix some of those things. So um, just keep an eye out for that during our capital improvement uh, discussions with our budget, we're uh, making crosswalks a priority for the next couple of years and identifying some uh, much needed uh, places where we can install those, which is pretty exciting. Um, electric vehicle charging grant update. So this discussion was had at the last council meeting and the application is complete and was being submitted today. So I wanna thank uh, Jessica for her work on that uh, project and uh, as well as Ryan Paisley, service director. They both did a great job in identifying the uh, library in the city building and trying to figure out how to make that possible to uh, hopefully get uh, electric vehicle charging stations installed. So the full application for Green County, there were five, um, five locations which are included in the grant and two of them were ours. So that's pretty good. So keeping our fingers crossed, those uh, those awards should be announced, I believe it's uh, January of this coming year. So we will uh, stay updated on that and I will keep you all updated on that. So coronavirus, coronavirus relief funds. So House Bill 614 is making its way through. Um, I believe it's awaiting DeWine's signature if it hasn't already happened. Um, so that, House bill is accomplishing two different things. One of them is affording a third round of funding to local governments. And I'm not 100% sure on what our exact allocation is going to be, but I have every reason to believe from what I've, what I've seen and read that it's going to be pretty significant. We've already received $180,000. 
So I will keep you all updated because that money will come from federal level down to the state level, down to the county level, and then back to us. So um, we're hopeful that in the next week or two, we will know exactly what that is, and I will keep you all updated. The second thing that House Bill 614 did, in addition to allocating a third round of funding, is it did change the timeline for encumbering the funds from October 15th to November 20th, which is great because we, we are going to get another round of funding in the next week or two. And in order to spend that by October 15th would pretty much be impossible. So that extension is much needed and we're very thankful for that. So we continue to try to figure out how to best utilize that money and uh, they keep changing the guidance. Uh, they just released a new guidance document from the state level um, on the 21st of September. So it keeps changing. So, um, you know, we're spending little bits of money as we can um, for things that we know are guaranteed um, applicable to the guidance that's come out. But like I said, it keeps changing. So before we exhaust all of the funding, we want to make sure that what we allocate the rest of uh, rest of the money to is going to be um, we're going to have the ability to do um, one of the other things that was mentioned um, in terms of an idea of what to do with some of that money was a Wi-Fi hotspot and I can't remember what conversation this came up in but it was um, asked of me and maybe it wasn't even in a city council meeting but I know that a couple of other communities are installing Wi-Fi hotspots for community use and so I looked into that possibility and uh, to turn our city administration building into a Wi-Fi hotspot that would um, have a range of a city block was only going to cost us, I think it was it was either thirteen or sixteen hundred dollars, but one way or another, it was less than two thousand dollars to turn our uh, city building into a Wi-Fi public hotspot, which is pretty awesome. So I went ahead and I um, authorized that to happen. That work will be done on October 5th and the best part about that is it's not going to make our monthly uh, ongoing costs go up so that's pretty great so we just have to pay for the initial infrastructure which like I said less than two thousand dollars and anybody that would be in need of utilizing uh, public internet that might not have access would be able to come to the city building and do that so the second part of that is I want to try to look for uh, ways to to put some seating outside of the city building so that if people do want to come and do homework, um, students want to come and do homework, or if citizens want to come and use the public Wi-Fi for their own, um, their own reasons, um, I want to try to figure out how we might be able to get some seating so that people are able to um, be able to utilize that in a comfortable spot at the city building. So. All of that is going to be using coronavirus relief funds, which is pretty awesome. We are also looking at trying to uh, make that capability happen at the library also, but that's a little trickier because they, it's a city owned building, but their IT is not through the city. So that's something that we're trying to um, collaborate on. So I will keep everybody posted on that. Melissa. Yeah. Just a quick question for you on that, please. I like the idea of public Wi-Fi, but I am assuming when you talk about uh, the um, like our tech advisors that everything is filtered or protected. The same protections going into the um, the internal city stuff will be applied to that. Yes. So we have made great um, strides with our security and making sure that things are isolated. So that would be a network that would be completely independent of any of our city servers and infrastructure and things like that. So it will absolutely be secure. Um, we just got back our annual lead and copper testing for our water. And um, each year we sample 20 homes. And so um, our service department has a list of homes and that's a volunteer basis where we drop off the test kits, we give them the instructions, they, uh, they collect water samples, they give them back to us and we send them off for testing. So there are stipulations in terms of the age of the homes, things like that, because the lead that we're testing for is not within our infrastructure, but it's within the homes infrastructure, which is why we test some of the older homes, because they are more susceptible to having 
lead inside of their infrastructure and their internal plumbing. So we got our uh, test results back and what we did was we introduced phosphates into our water back in 2017 and some of you might uh, have remembered that and um, the lead levels within that interior plumbing of the homes that we have tested have consistently went down since we added those phosphates and what the phosphates do is it's a microscopic coating that is um, that ends up being applied to the internal plumbing of the homes in which the water is passing through. So those homes that we have tested, the, the lead levels have consistently went down since the addition of the phosphates, which is great. But it is worth noting that the lead levels that we have always picked up have always been very trace amounts. So nothing that would be concerning or over any sort of uh, EPA threshold um, so that's all very good. So some of the things that we've been doing to try to um, help reduce any levels of lead, even though they were only trace amounts to begin with, um, have worked in the past couple of years. So if anybody has any specific questions on that, um, Ryan is your guy. Uh, he gave me a crash course in phosphates and lead and copper testing, and hopefully I conveyed that uh, well today. But if you have any specific questions on that, um, Ryan can definitely help you to understand some of those things. Um, North Bellevue, uh, construction is finally in full swing, which is great. And the footers have been poured and the concrete arch is really the big piece of this um, infrastructure that's gonna be put in and it is set to be delivered on October 2nd. So that will be this coming Friday. So it's gonna come in in a number of different sections. They're gonna have some large trucks that are coming in and doing that. So I know that we're all really excited to see that, that setting of that concrete arch happen. Um, so that's gonna happen on October 2nd. So we will see quite a bit of progress on that project uh, at the completion of this week. And I also have the uh, fire chief search and hiring timeline which is included in my update uh, print version. So with the impending retirement of Chief Neidhard, um, December 31st, I have a timeline that's been laid out. So I worked through this with him. And what we did was we took his retirement date and we kind of worked backwards to try to figure out all of the steps that we would need to go through so that we would know um, what the appropriate timeline would be to post the position, receive applications, have interviews, and make sure that everything would be done um, within a good time frame before he retires. So um, we plan to post that position on October the 12th. So that will be on the city's website and we will post that to a number of different um, professional organization websites um, externally as well. So. We have that, and I think that that is it in terms of my city manager update. Thank you, Melissa. Does anyone have questions of the city manager? None for me. Seeing none, thanks, Melissa. Let's move on to old business. The Family Resource Center update. And I see Kelsey's in the audience. Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for having me back. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on the dispersal of the COVID relief funds. The families who received the financial support from the CARES Act Coronavirus Relief Fund were selected through a survey that I discussed last time I was here that we created and distributed to all of our clients. The survey asked each client if they were negatively financially impacted due to COVID-19, uh, COVID if they were struggling to pay their bills and if they were facing eviction or utility disconnections. The survey is still being distributed weekly with our food pantry email sign up to all of our clients. So all new clients also have the opportunity to fill out the form and people who have filled it out before have the opportunity to update their response if their financial situation has changed. The Family Resource Center Board Chair, Nancy Pestian and I formulated a plan to distribute the funds using a phased approach based on need as determined by the survey. In phase one, I analyzed the data to identify clients who were imminently at risk of being evicted or having their utilities disconnected. I contacted each client over the phone and asked them to provide us documentation that could demonstrate this need and show that it was due to a negative financial impact from COVID-19, such as a furlough, business closure, 
loss of child support, payment, et cetera. I asked them to provide as much documentation as they possibly could, plus a personalized letter that explained their story and how COVID-19 and the shutdown had a negative financial impact on their family. Once I had these materials together, Nancy and I sat down to determine who would receive what amount based on their need while considering the amount of funding we had available to us. The majority of families, which was six, received $1,000. Three families received $1,500 based on extenuating circumstances that led us to understand that their situation was more dire. And one family received 300 because that was the amount they needed to prevent eviction and they already had a plan for being caught up by the next month. So in total, we have distributed funds to 10 families and distributed a total of 10,800 of the $20,000 we received. As each client received their funds, I sat down with them and we discussed the limitations of use and each client signed a statement of understanding or contract where they agreed that they would only utilize the funds for necessary bills and would provide us with documentation of how the money was spent if requested. Most of the clients followed up with me very quickly to provide this documentation unprompted. We were able to meet the immediate need of those who were facing eviction and utilities being shut off at that point. But as part of our plan, we have kept some of the money available because as time goes on, we have additional families who are saying that they are now in more dire financial straits be, uh, due to being unable to catch up on bills from the negative financial impact of COVID-19 shutdowns. We have about eight families in this situation currently where they have indicated to us that things have gotten worse since the survey was first issued. We are now working with them to gather this documentation so that we can disperse money to them as well. We have 18 other families who have had a negative financial impact due to COVID-19 and are struggling to pay their bills, but when they filled out the survey, they were not at risk of eviction or disconnection. Ideally, we would like to be able to provide financial assistance to them as well to help ease the stress of the difficulties the pandemic has caused financially. The feedback I have received from the clients we have been able to, to assist, been able to assist has been overwhelming and wonderful. To hear that we have had a small hand in alleviating some of their stress has been amazing. And we are so grateful to you for allowing us to allocate these funds to Bellbrook community members. You have truly made a difference in their lives. Your funds helped a single mom of four currently fighting cancer, a single grandmother raising her granddaughter who has not received child support in months due to her daughter being furloughed, a single mother of two who was a home health aide, but none of her clients wanted her in their house in the midst of the pandemic, and a teacher who was working two jobs to make ends meet, but was furloughed from her second job for months, to name just a few of them. Um, I also wanted to give you a small update on things at the Family Resource Center, but I would love to hear if anybody has any questions or comments before I move into that part. Kelsey, first off, thanks so much for what you do, and thanks for being such a good steward of the money. I think okay. it's uh, what you presented is an excellent use of the money. I'm glad we're able to help the Resource Center and help the individual families out as well. Thank you. Does anyone account so many questions for Kelsey at this point? I can see them all, Kelsey, they're shaking their heads no, so go ahead and continue. Thank you. Um, we have been extremely busy at the Family Resource Center over the past few months. In the next few weeks, we will actually be changing our name to the Bellbrook Sugar Creek Community Support Center and rebranding everything um, that we do as a part of that. This name change comes with a variety of program additions, such as nutrition classes that will begin the week of October 12th and support group offerings that we are currently getting organized. We just had a social work intern join our team for the year who will be helping us get those off the ground. We also have a new volunteer coordinator who will be helping us manage the generous and dedicated volunteers who help us um, and will help us recruit others as needed. We've also been changing the physical space of the center as well. So we were there probably a total of 18 hours over the weekend um, working on setting up a classroom and as part of this we reduced the size of the clothing clothing closet that we've had to offer only new children's shoes new socks and underwear of all sizes winter outerwear and emergency clothing to help people in cases of leaving an abusive home gazing, gain, gaining custody of a new child a fire etc we found that having a large clothing closet was not a great use of space based on the number of people who utilized it. So we are very happy to be transitioning the space into a classroom. We will still be providing Thanksgiving and Christmas assistance, and we will be setting out warm outerwear for our clients to take as needed on Wednesday, October 7th. We are serving approximately 30 families per week through our food pantry, and we will continue to operate our food pantry program as it has been. 
Um, if you have any questions or if anybody would like to talk more about what we're doing, I'm often at the Family Resource Center um, or I can be reached over email. So thank you again for entrusting me to allocate these funds on behalf of the city. And it's, you have no idea what a pleasure it's been to be able to tell people that the city has uh, is able to financially support them. It's been wonderful. So thank you very much. You're, wel you're welcome, Kelsey. And thank you very much for what you do. It sounds like you've been extremely busy. <laughs> we have been. Any questions of council? No, I just wanted to uh, second the mayor's comments. Thank you very much, Kelsey, for all that you do. Awesome work. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. We have more money coming, so we'll see what we can do with it and how we divvy it up. There's some confusion as to how much it'll be, but we'll look and see and find out what the rules are and take it from there. But thanks again for what you do for us. And again, you've been a great steward of the money, and I appreciate how you put it to good use. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next up on the agenda, new business is updates to the personnel policy manual. This goes back to our city manager. Okay, so this is the balance of the 105 page packet that was uh, <laughs> in everybody's <laughs> inbox. So um, I just wanted to go over a couple of things. I wanted council to have the opportunity to be able to see this and offer feedback before it comes uh, by way of ordinance, which hopefully can happen at the next meeting. And um, there are, it looks like a lot of changes, but it's not really a lot of change. So the way that this was structured in the past was there was our personnel manual and then outside of that there were administrative policies so a lot of the red that you see throughout the manual is basically the incorporation of the administrative policies so i had folded those in because i didn't really understand why they were disconnected and most of the administrative policies that we had um, were part of other cities formal personnel policy manuals and i just thought that it made sense to have it all in one document very above board um, so that council is able to see all of it and prove and approve all of it as one document so the bulk of the changes are the folding in of the administrative policies that have always existed so i kind of abbreviated some of them because some of them were very lengthy and overlapped with a lot of other things that were in our personnel policy manual so i i folded those in and then the main changes that were made were i incorporated parental leave which was part of the uh fire or not the fire the police sergeant and officers contracts and something that i wanted to be able to offer citywide so um I did include that in the general personnel policy manual. So just to refresh everybody, that is two weeks for a male or female employee that can be used in addition to sick leave and in uh, conjunction with FMLA for the birth or adoption of a child. So they can use that for um, appointments that surround the birth or adoption or uh, to take time off in order to be able to bond with the child. So that's um that's a policy that again was folded into the uh, police officer and police sergeant contracts and i want to be able to offer that citywide so that was included and the other major change um is again another item that was folded into the uh the fop contracts which is the striking of the award of personal days for not utilizing sick leave and instead just offering those as personal days to the employees without the exchange of it being an award for no sick leave so i think that that's important especially given the uh, current um, environment that we're in with the pandemic it was a deterrent to to utilize sick leave, knowing that you would be able to uh, have personal days if you didn't call off. So I just think that that was just a bad practice. And uh, so again, that's just bringing, uh, bringing the personal policy manual in line with uh, the police contracts. Uh, so 
those are the changes that I made. There were a few language tweaks that were made. One that I feel is, is pretty notable and important. And uh, there are different policies in the section uh, number six, which is employee conduct. There, we had a zero tolerance clause for workplace violence. And I duplicated that zero tolerance clause and uh, incorporated that into section 6.2, which is discrimination and sexual harassment. I, uh, I felt that it was very important uh, to include a zero tolerance policy for discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace and uh, extend that beyond uh, workplace violence because I feel like that's a very important position for the city to take and um, message for our employees to understand that that's not something that we're going to tolerate. So that was uh, one of the language changes that I felt was pretty important to fold into our policies. So other than that, it's really just the merging of the administrative policies and uh, then the change to the uh, sick leave award or the personnel time personal time award for no use of sick leave in, in exchange uh, offering personal days and then the parental leave. So that is what is before you in this very large document. And if uh, council has any comments, suggestions, feedback um, on any of this prior to it coming back in ordinance format, then I am absolutely willing to entertain and incorporate any of that uh, that you might have. So that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions of the city manager? I read all the red. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of reading. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> Melissa, why don't you go ahead and prepare it then for ordinance and uh, maybe highlight the the three or four changes you mentioned as far as the section we can focus on so we don't have to necessarily read the entire 105 pages although i'm sure we all uh, anxiously look forward to doing that but uh, we may not want to do it as much any other comments uh, those personnel manuals are tough so thanks for taking the time melissa and trying to make it right <laughs> yeah they are thanks. they are okay thanks melissa committee reports service Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple things. Uh, next week, <clears throat> the service department will start flushing hydrants. Be all five days next week, 8.30 to 3.30. Uh, suggested not to wash any white linens or clothes. Uh, could be a possible rust and debris. It's also suggested if you have a water softener Replace it and bypass to keep sediments and uh, possibly uh, rust and stuff getting into your media, which can damage your water softener. And uh, the only other thing was the uh, PFAS test came back for our water and it was, they found a trace amount, which basically nothing, but since they did find a trace amount, <clears throat> We'll have uh, every quarter so the water will be tested at least four more times. Um, I'm just tickled to death that we're doing all this testing. You know where you stand. We're good so far. And um, as I mentioned a few months ago, with the technology that we have and the ability to pick up parts per trillion, these types of tests will probably be on the increase. And it just uh, allows you to know if you got good water or if you do find something, you can find out where the contaminant came from and then take ways or remediate it, make sure our water supply is, water supply is safe. Bellbrook has always been very good at uh, going on the offensive and keeping good pure water. And I uh, thank Ryan and his crews for uh, uh, supporting that. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks. Good update. Thank you. Appreciate it. Safety. No uh, updates for this meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you, TJ. 
Finance and audit. Nick is not here. Does anyone else want to speak? I look to Nick to keep teaching me about city finances, Mayor. <laughs> Thank you. Community affairs. Uh, I don't have anything other than I think, isn't there a police uh, recognition on the second or to put blue, blue lights out? Does anybody know about that? I think that that was kind of a grassroots community effort. Nobody has um, notified the city of anything formally for us to be able to communicate, at least from my end. So I'm not 100% sure. No, I, I just heard about it somewhere and I, I didn't know if anybody knew about it, but I think it's a pretty cool idea. I just don't know when it is. But other than that, I don't have anything. Okay, thanks, Lane. Now we have the clerk's update. Pam, go ahead and tell us what lies ahead. Okay, so um, we had the work session tonight on CICs. The next meeting, which will be Monday, October 12th, will begin at 6.30 with a work session discussing the fire station consolidation results. And then um, there will be uh, the next two meetings, October 26th and November 9th, we'll have work sessions for the budget discussions uh, preparing next year's budget and then on the 23rd of november will be a work session uh, that will combine the discussions coming out of the cic work session today and the firehouse consolidation which is next time so lots of work sessions for everyone coming up in the future um, the legislative items coming up we have uh, several ordinances you're going to be seeing soon one is a update in the guidelines for members of boards commissions and committees and uh, there's going to be um, an ordinance amending a part of section 18.2 uh, having to do with permitted signs and uh, time restrictions there um, several of these things are with the municipal attorney and once they get through that point they'll be coming to you all um, and then we will have the ordinance uh, to approve the updated personnel manual so uh, there's several things that are going to be coming forward from the planning board in the near future one is updates to article 14 uh, updates to uh, um, 1820b which is the sign code for the village district and the vacancy registration requirements so planning board's busy so that'll all be heading your way and i think that's everything i can think of um did i miss anything melissa that you can think of there's probably other things we'll let you know <laughs> that's enough business for the next couple months for us thank you very much pam this time, open discussion. We'll go alphabetically. Uh, Mr. Greenwood. Um, nothing, nightmare. Thank you, Councilman Havens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, nothing tonight. Thank you, Councilman Oak. Nothing tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Middlestetter. I don't have anything either. Okay, thank you. And Councilman Vanville Heisen. Nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. The only comment I have, I just think it's been a nice uh, range with the uh, Family Resource Center, and I appreciate uh, Kelsey coming to give us an update. It sounds like we've really spent money in the right direction and for the right causes, and I appreciate her taking over the administrative task of how to allocate those funds and what's the best way to do it. I think we've got great results so far. That being the case, do we have any comments from the public? Uh, yes, we did. Have, we have one person who wanted to speak. So I'm uh, introducing Corey Collins. So he should and be. Corey, please state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Uh, my name is Corey Collins. Uh, can I get a mic check? I, yes, check. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. You. Thank you. Okay, Corey Collins, 1981 Cabernet Way. I'm in the vineyards. And for a couple of years now, we have been trying to connect to downtown 
our, our common area does touch 725, and we had previously discussed with Mr. Uh, Mark, I can't pronounce his last name, Schleck Heck, uh, the previous uh, uh, the previous, uh, previous city manager, we had a meeting with him about uh, going downtown and how we could connect up there. And we asked uh, for a crosswalk, uh, just the striping and the signage to be put in. And we were denied then because he said it was a safety issue uh, due to the speed uh, going down 725 right there where it's 35. Uh, also, there was a uh, discussion about putting in a sidewalk that would connect up there to the land um, that would then go up to the light next to the church. And they said that was a cost issue. I think it was, I think it was at the time as quoted at like 90,000. Um, so what we had just asked just for signage and, and stripes to be put along the road right there to cross over because our community, you know, wants to go downtown. We want to visit McIntosh. We want to be able to go to the Sugar Maple Parade, uh, our kids to get safely out of the neighborhood because currently we're, we're stuck in our neighborhood and have no ability to get safely out of it by foot. Um, and we all know Little Sugar Creek is, is a death trap. So uh, we want to be able to, you know, get safely to downtown to visit, um, you know, all the stores down there to, you know, everybody wants to go to the dairy shed during the summer. We want to get the kids down there. There's all kinds of things going on. Uh, so we just want more opportunity to, to visit the town and, you know, the walkability factor when you have, you know, the three most affluent neighborhoods in the area that have no access to downtown, it kind of hurts that walkability. Uh, or in any type of investment in the downtown area. Um, so that, that was my two cents. Um, so I just, I just welcomed the, the discussion earlier uh, about the walkability of downtown. I hope that discussion continues um, so that maybe we can connect up. Thank you, Corey. And possibly, Melissa, is this something we can revisit to see if it makes sense to put some striping, at least crosswalks down there? It sounds like that's the low cost option. The sidewalk could be something probably a little bit more expensive we wouldn't be able to enter into right now but possibly since we've only got four crosswalks maybe think about adding a fifth yeah we we actually had a conversation about um and i always get it confused whether it's the vineyards or sable ridge is first and i think it's sable ridge is the second one but at least getting a connection that gets over to um closer to highview terrace to get up that way with the they're going to have that connection at some point. So we have we have been thinking about those neighborhoods and what the best way to kind of deal with that is. So it's definitely on our radar. Just you know what the what the actual solution is going to be is kind of up in the air, but it's not something that is lost on us. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, and Corey. Thanks so much for your comments. Anyone else tonight, Pam? Okay. Does any member of council have any more matters or any more business to bring before us this evening? None, Mayor. Seeing none, I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much for attending.